former Reagan White House policy analyst Dinesh D'Souza, and economics professor Stephen Landsberg present a debate on religion. Freedom Fest 2010, a libertarian conference held annually in Las Vegas, hosts this 50-minute event. Promise number one is that you're going to have a fun and fascinating hour here with our trial of the millennium. Promise number two is that we will end by 6.30 because Tammy told me that the union kicks into triple overtime at 6.31. So, <laughs> so we will be done on time. All right, all of our jurors are there. Great. Uh, I will be the marshal for this affair. Please now all rise as we welcome Judge Stephen Moore, member of the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, who will be presiding at this hearing. Judge Moore. I will now call this court in session. Boy, this is an honor, by the way. I never even went to law school, <laughs> and I get to be a judge. Um, ladies and gentlemen, members of the jury, we are gathered here in the great sovereign state of Nevada to decide the fate of our most sacred beliefs in this trial of the century. In this hearing, we hope to discover if religious faith in a higher authority, an almighty God, is beneficial to our well-being and our society or a perverse and false tradition that should be abandoned. You may sit. <laughs> Before this court, the prosecution will attempt to show that the major religions and their adherents have subverted the advance of science, fostered fanatic and even antisocial behavior even to the point of violence, abuse, and perverse behavior, whether it be Christian, Jewish, or Muslim. Those are pretty serious charges. We have brought before the court Mr. Dinesh D'Souza, one of the premier members of the Hoover Institution and author of numerous books defending traditional Christian faith and other religious beliefs, including a belief in the afterlife. Mr. D'Souza, please stand. <laughs> Mr. D'Souza, you and your religious supporters have been accused of subverting science. Please stand. <laughs> Mr. D'Souza, you and your religious supporters have been accused of subverting science fostering fanaticism and encouraging bigotry. How do you and your supporters plead? Not guilty, Your Honor. You sure you don't want to cop a plea? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Not guilty. We will begin this proceeding with a five-minute opening statement, first by the prosecuting attorney, Stephen Landsberg. here. Okay. You know, D Dinesh has a pretty tough job here because Dinesh is here to defend religion. Not any particular religion, but religion in general. And that's a tough job because everybody agrees that most religions are false. Christians believe that Islam is false. Muslims believe that Hinduism is false. Hindus believe that Judaism is false. Jews believe that Wicca is false. Dinesh is a Christian. He believes most of those religions are false, but he's here to defend them. Which means Dinesh is here to defend the proposition that it's good for people to believe false things. Now, maybe that's true. Right? Maybe, it's good, maybe it is good for people to believe false things, but let's not lose sight of the fact that that's what he's got to prove. 
And let's look at the track record for people who have believed false things. We've got a lot of history to look at. Human beings have been around for 100,000 years or so. Religion's been around for most of that time. And for all but the last 200 or so of that 100,000 years, nearly everybody who ever lived lived right about at the subsistence level, on the verge of starvation. For 100,000 years, people turned to religion to lift themselves out of poverty. And for 100,000 years, it didn't work. They built magnificent cathedrals to appease their gods. When that didn't work, they built more cathedrals. And we look back on those cathedrals with awe, but save a little awe, too, for the awesome tragedy of pouring all those resources into church architecture while, while hundreds of thousands were starving. It was not the forces of religion that broke the cycle of poverty. It was the twin forces of modern science and capitalism. Now, I'm expecting Dinesh to tell you that religion laid the groundwork for modern science. The problem with that is that religion failed for 100,000 years before science came along. Or if Dinesh wants to say, oh, well, those ancient religions, they don't count. He just wants to look at the relative newcomers like Christianity. OK, fine. Christianity failed for almost two millennia before science came along. In the fourth century AD, Christianity was well established, and the whole world was starving. A thousand years later, nothing had changed. Um, so religion has completely failed to nourish our bodies. Now let's ask if it's done anything to nourish our souls. I'm, I'm expecting Dinesh to tell you that religion is the source of all morality. Religion is what tells us the difference between right and wrong. The problem with that is that different religions say different things. Religion A says, Mr. Lansford, do you think you could maybe wrap this up anytime soon, sir? Um, uh, I, <laughs> How much, how much I know you're I a professor, and I know that you're used to filibustering and so on, but please, we've, we want to get on with this trial. I was told sir. I had five and a half minutes. All right. You have 30 seconds. I have 30, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, sir. Uh, <laughs> but there's so much to say. No, I, I, was, I was promised five and a half minutes here. I'm going to demand it. You have 20 seconds, sir. <laughs> <laughs> different religions say different things. When one says, thou shalt not murder, and the other says, kill the infidel, if we can tell that one of those religions is better than the other, we must be getting that information from something other than religion. And indeed, our greatest moral leaders have not needed religion to tell them the difference between right and wrong. Thomas Paine. Sir, your time is up. Your time is up. By the way, um, let me just say, um, uh, you may, you may say, uh, Steve Landsberg is, I, I neglected to uh, tell you about his, um, his resume and his accomplishments, and let me just spend a minute doing that. Steve Landsberg is professor of economics at the University of Rochester, where he was recently awarded the university's professor of the year in social sciences. He earned his PhD in math from the University of Chicago in 1979. Most importantly, he is the author of the bestseller, The Armchair Economist, and one of my favorite books of all time that my wife does not agree with, More Sex is Better Sex. <laughs> uh, Mr. Landsberg, I just have to ask you, does that mean there's no such thing as bad sex? It, me it means you got the title wrong. <laughs> more sex is safer sex. Oh, <laughs> more sex is safer sex. OK. Uh, now. <laughs> I like more sex is better sex. Uh, uh, before I allow Mr. D'Souza to give his opening statement, I wanted to say something to the jury, if I may. I would like to give your, your instructions. You will listen carefully to the opening statements and the witnesses, and at the end of this hearing, you will be required to determine whether there is sufficient evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. D'Souza and his religious followers, and God, are responsible for antisocial behavior and anti-scientific beliefs in this country and should not, in good conscience, continue their beliefs in a higher being. Is that understood? All right. Now, Mr. D'Souza, you have five minutes for an opening statement. If I have a difficult challenge, namely defending believers in different religions, 
Mr. Landsberg has an even more difficult challenge, which is that the vast, vast majority of people in the world believe in God. And they always have. So he's got to convince you that he's right and everybody else is wrong. In other words, these are people who have religious experience, experience that leads them to certain convictions. Now imagine if we went to a village and we knew nothing about the village, and 95% of the people in the village said that we know this guy named Bill. How do we know him? We experience him. We have a relationship with Bill. We know Bill. Bill is part of our lives. But there are five guys who deny Bill. Some of them say, we've never met the guy. Some of them say, there is no Bill and the other 95% are making the guy up. So, if you knew nothing else, which is more likely? Is it more likely that the 95% people, percent of people are lying? Their experience is somehow bogus, they're making it up, they're hallucinating? Or is it more likely that the 95% of people are describing a real experience and the two or three guys who deny it just don't know Bill? Now, for millennia, as Professor Landberg says, uh, mankind lived in destitution, in poverty, in want, no capitalism, no science, uh, no democracy, no sense of universal rights. But now we come to a rather interesting question. Only in one civilization, namely the Western, did these ideas germinate. Why? Why do these ideas happen in Western culture and nowhere else? Now, a lot of scholars have looked at this. We have two scholars who have looked at it, and we're going to be talking to them. The argument that I want to make is not that religion in general, but I want to look at our civilization and the things that we hold dear, not just believers, even atheists. The material abundance, the uh, sense of curiosity, uh, the scientific mode of thinking. Why did those things happen in Western civilization, a civilization that was built on two pillars, Athens and Jerusalem? Why didn't they occur elsewhere? Does Athens and Jerusalem have something to do with the fact that those things occurred here? So we're going to talk to one witness who's going to talk about the great achievements of the West. And then we have a witness that's going to look at things in a very practical way, because ultimately, when we look at certain questions, for example, is there life after death, we can't know. We can't know on the basis of reason. Shakespeare calls death the undiscovered country. So we can't say uh, confidently there is life after death. We can't say confidently there Mr. isn't. Mr. D'Souza, in the name of the God that you say you believe in, can you please wrap this up? You I have 30 seconds, sir. I will take my <laughs> extra 30 seconds. So. We have to ask if these beliefs, if we can't know if they are true, are they good for us? Does it make sense to believe? Does belief make you a better person? If it does, then belief wins by the evolutionary test. It wins by the pragmatic test. It is not only true to believe, it is also good to believe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. D'Souza. <laughs> Mr. Landsberg. Please call your first witness. I call Michael Shermer. That's the way you dress in this court, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I hold you in contempt. <laughs> uh, will you please put your hand on the Holy Bible to... Uh, you can, actually. <laughs> Anticipating that, I brought Origin of the Species. Would, would that work? <laughs> okay. Do you promise to tell the court the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, Darwin. <laughs> okay. Please. Mr. Shermer, can you state your name and occupation? Michael Shermer, publisher of Skeptic Magazine. And you got to tell us a little about your expertise on science and religion. Uh, we study uh, the relationship of science and religion for a living, basically looking at uh, is there any way to prove that uh, a god exists or that there is an afterlife, what's the evidence for and against, as well as 
is religion good or bad for society? And what conclusions have you drawn about whether religion is good or bad for society? Basically, two lines of evidence. First, uh, is religion good for individuals? And second, is it good for groups or nations or societies? The first line of evidence, I take straight from uh, George Barna's uh, research, his own institution, uh, as a born-again evangelical Christian who collects data on the effects of his own religion on behavior, he concludes that there's no difference between those who are believers and those who are not believers in terms of moral behavior, that is divorce rate, adultery rate, cheating in business rate, and so on. It doesn't make individuals more or less uh, moral. The second line of evidence um, comes from the study of sort of a comparative method of looking at different groups, different countries, different nations. The United States, for example, is the most religious of the 19 industrialized democracies in the world. We also have the highest rates of STD, the highest rates of teen pregnancy, the highest rates of abortion, the highest rates of teen suicide, the highest rates of homicides. Now you can debate whether religion is the cause of that or not, or multiple variables causing these, these different effects. But if religion is such a great prophylactic against immoral behavior, why are we the most religious nation and we have the highest rates of these social ills? If it's so great at preventing those, why does it not do that? Second on that, in South America, these are the most religious countries in the world, 99.9% .9 of most of the South American countries uh, are believers, and, and yet they live in, in most of these countries, abject poverty and lack of education and so on. If religion is so good for um, these countries, why are they so poor? Why are they, why are they so uneducated? And then third, Europe has the lowest rates uh, of all the industrialized nations of religious uh, beliefs, and yet economically, socially, they're quite healthy. Their rates of happiness are soaring off the charts and so on. All right, Mr. Lansbury, you have time for one more quick question. Were your children raised with religion, and do you think they've turned out okay? <laughs> I have one daughter. She just uh, she starts college, and according to her, she's just fine, thank you, without religion. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Oh. D'Souza. Oh, I thought I was free. Uh, uh, <laughs> Hardly. Uh, Hardly. <laughs> I know this guy. <laughs> you mentioned some of the um, wonderful things that are happening in Europe. Isn't it true that um, Europe is also, is, well, first of all, isn't it true that Europe was framed, formed as a Christian society? Yes, initially it was. And isn't it true that a society that's been Christian for 2,000 years is likely to have at least some residue of those Christian values in European society? Maybe. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> From a hostile witness. <laughs> and isn't it true that the United States, which has these pathologies that you described, is also an immigrant society, an upwardly mobile society, and therefore more likely to have higher rates of crime and for other reasons have some of the problems you described? I don't think the immigrants are that new associated with those issues. I think these are multiple generations, multi-generational problems. But isn't it true that a society continually replenished with immigrants is likely to be a more upwardly mobile, unstable, and maybe criminally oriented society than one that is more hierarchical, that doesn't have this sort of upheaval? I would not make that conclusion, no. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about science, because Skeptic Magazine is all about science. I'd like to ask you about some prominent scientists, because uh, we want to see what the scientific habit of mind does for religion. Would you agree that 95% of all the greatest scientists who have ever lived, approximately, have been believers in God? Yeah, but they also believe all kinds of other goofy things that we don't believe anymore today. It's sort of irrelevant. When they're doing science, they're just doing science. Their ancillary beliefs, most of them didn't believe in democracy. Can you just so please give a yes or no answer, sir? Okay. Let me go further. Yes. Isn't it true that when it comes to scientists, specifically Kepler, uh, Boyle, Newton, not only did they happen to believe in God, but they saw their belief in God as instrumental in shaping their scientific outlook on the world. The idea of a rational universe... Mr. D'Souza, are you asking a question or making a statement here? Uh, I'm at, Can I'm you get to the point, please? I'm asking a leading Which is? question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and what is the question? A, and I will give you a leading answer. Yes, you're correct. <laughs> and two, Stephen Hawking, Albert Einstein, we're not, are not believers. We're not and are not believers. Last question. 
Isn't it true that Darwin argues in The Origin of Species that our minds are shaped for survival and not for truth? Yes. And given that, isn't it true that nothing that you say can be trusted since your mind has been shaped for survival, <laughs> not for truth? Mm. <laughs> That's our order of we the do. Board, please. That's I'd love to hear Mr. Ladsberg's out to that one. We believe in what Take works, and science is the best tool we have for devising uh, and uh, of answering questions about what's actually true in the world instead of what we want to be true. And that's why we follow science instead of our herd instincts. Mr. Sherm Shermer, you may step down. Mr. Landsberg, uh, call your next witness. I called. <laughs> I called Doug Casey. Welcome, Mr. Casey. Would you stand right here, please? Will you take an oath on the Holy Bible? No, I won't. Why is uh, that, sir? Okay. Well, I came prepared. I have a copy of Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Will you take an oath on that? <laughs> oh, that'll do in a pinch. Uh, do you promise to tell the court the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth according to your objectivist, libertarian, crazy philosophy? No, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the truth as it exists. Please be seated. <laughs> Mr. Casey, can you tell us your name and your occupation, a little about yourself? Uh, Doug Casey, by occupation speculator. Can you hold that microphone a little closer? You might be able to take that out. And uh, how... is this going against our time? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Go ahead. How, um, how many countries have you lived in? Uh, Twelve. Twelve. And how many have you visited? 175, roughly. And in your observations of these many different countries and many different civilizations, what have you observed about the, the effects of religion? Uh, religion is a disaster uniformly and everywhere, and I'd like to give you some reasons why I say that. That's not just an assertion on my part. I'm not going to address the ridiculousness of the beliefs of the, uh, of the followers of the, the God Yahweh or the God Jesus or the God Holy Ghost or Allah. I don't want to talk about us how absurd it is to believe in the, the ascension and the assumption and raising the dead and all these party tricks that Chris Angel could do much better than here in, in Vegas at any point. I, I don't, I don't uh, even want to talk about uh, the fairy tales from primitive Middle Eastern tribes that all these things arose, uh, arose from. Uh, they're both good and original, but what's good is not original and what's original is not good in them. It's the original case of that. Uh, I don't want to talk about all the disasters. What do you want to talk about, Mr. Casey? <laughs> I want to talk about the fact that the Middle Eastern religions of Yahweh and Allah are destructive, they're degrading, they're authoritarian, they're uh, ethically bankrupt, and people should just forget about them and throw them on the scrap heap of history. And I say this for three more reasons. One Give is just one, please. Well, should I take aesthetics, ethics, or psychology? Uh, I could take them in reverse order. All of these religions were, were founded by schizophrenics that heard voices in their head. Uh, I don't believe in psychiatry, but they'd be locked up by psychiatrists today, and justifiably. Uh, should I talk about the, their complete lack of, uh, of ethics, the fact that Yahweh himself was uh, sometimes a spoiled child and at other times a pathological uh, genocidal maniac wiping out whole cities and so forth? Uh, sh should I talk about the, the, the lack of uh, aesthetics of these religions, uh, that their followers historically have always been slaves, losers, the bottom of society? Uh, so people that couldn't let me just make sure I understand your point. You don't like religion. <laughs> no, it's... It's, it's, it's one of the worst elements in... in All right, we in get a, the point. Do you have any more questions for the witness? Do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, <laughs> I, I, well 
Uh, actually, I, 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 I could go on and on about this, but I'd say it's a sickness, very much like the people that love the state, they're generally, not always, the same people that love religion. And uh, I don't want to insult those of you out there who are believers, because, it's my, because I think that those of you who are sincere believers you know, may have had some neurons bouncing around in your head that made you see a vision. That's possible. And many more of you are actually trying to improve conditions on Earth, uh, and you think mistakenly that religion is going to help, and you're trying to improve yourself and reach a spiritual peace. I, I, I'm all for that. I'm just saying you're taking the wrong road by following this false religion of Yahweh or Allah or the, the Holy Ghost, or whoever it is. Okay, worship. thank you so much. Mr. D'Souza, would you please disabuse this man of his views? <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at some of the people whose lives have been shaped by religion, and I'd like you to tell me if you consider them to be losers. Um, Augustine. A loser or yes not a loser? or no, please. Loser yes or, no. or no loser? Uh, a loser. Loser, okay. okay thank you. <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is by, by your fruits you shall know them. Exactly. Okay. And what that's about why you get the that. point? Let's look at uh, Bach. Bach. This is argument from authority. It's ridiculous. Loser or no loser, sir? Not authority. No, he's not a loser. He had musical right. skills. <laughs> what about Dante? Poetic skills. Milton. <laughs> Poetic skills. So what? What are you talking about? The guys about? who built the Gothic cathedrals. Architect Losers, every one of them. Architectural skills. We're not talking about the, the, the fact that certain compartments of their brains worked extremely well. It's like if you have a car, if it's, a, it's, right. it's, it's mechanical system might be great, but its electrical system is fried. Here's the, Since, since you're a speculator, we'll, we'll let people speculate about your systems and your gears. But let me come to some of the, the crimes of religion that you talked about. You refer to the, the terrible legacy, not just of the Bible, but of history. Let me, let me uh, would, would you agree the Inquisition is a horrible crime of religion? Sure. It's okay. a minor one for, for Yahweh's religion, but it's certainly one. Uh, how, how many people were killed in the Inquisition? It's a minor one. It's trivial by comparison to the religious wars. It's only these Middle Eastern religions that have caused the deaths of millions and millions with religious wars. The Inquisition's minor. It's a trivia. It's a daily thing for religion. So, so you have no idea how many people were killed? I don't know. Okay. Uh, you mentioned few, the religious few hundred, wars. I mean, a few hundred. It's, it's, it's trivial, I told you. Uh, what, what, what about the, you mentioned the religious wars. Let's talk about the biggest religious war in Europe, the Thirty Years' War. How many people were killed in that? Oh, I don't know. I, you I have no idea? Hundreds of thousands, I would think. And it was a religious war because there were religious people fighting on both sides, correct? It was there were the Catholics, there were the Protestants. Yes. Now, do you agree that France has been a Catholic country? France is a Catholic country. Do you know generally. which side France fought on in the Thirty Years' War? <sighs> Mr. D'Souza, what is your point, please? Well, my point is we are talking to an ignorant man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you know it's, it's, it's amazing. When I talk to you, I know I'm talking to a, a sophist, somebody that's not interested in truth, and you're not. All right, you're, 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 interested, you're, interested, you're interested in making debating points. It's idiocy. You have one I mean, more, you have time it, for one it, it more question. It's like the example you gave about Bill. Mr. Casey, you will be quiet or I will hold you in contempt of court. My last question, question is very simple. Mr. Casey, as a speculator, you are entitled to your own opinions. But do you feel you're also entitled to your own facts? No, no, I don't. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. D'Souza, you may call your witnesses. I call Charles Murray. <laughs> no, I can't. I, I, I can't swear in the Bible because my wife is a Quaker, and I, I'm not, but this is being broadcast by C-SPAN, or it's going to be sooner okay. or later. Oh, it's going to be seen all over the world thousands of times. My wife sees me swearing in the Bible, she'll give me hell. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, is there anything you would take an oath on? Just your word. Quakers and their husbands have to tell the truth all the time. Okay. We will accept That's good that. enough. Charles, can you tell us a little bit about your, your background and your education? I uh, was educated at uh, Harvard and MIT and uh, have been writing books ever since. 
You're a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. You've scholar published the, uh, the Bell Enterprise Curve, Institute. a number of books. Uh, and you published a very interesting book a few years ago called Human uh, Accomplishment, in which, as a non-believer, or would you describe yourself as more a social I, I'm an agnostic. You're an agnostic. And so you took on a agnostic investigation of what causes human achievement. That's right. What does? A lot of things, but relevant to the topic we're talking about tonight, what I hadn't expected to come to as a conclusion is that the reason you had this one small section of the Eurasian landmass that exploded into an unprecedented uh, five centuries of creativity uh, with the Renaissance had, had an enormous amount to do specifically with Christianity and Christian theology. So you're saying that the achievements of the West, the uh, abolition in the sense of want, the uh, germination of science, but also the pinnacles of creativity. Yeah, I'm talking about arts and sciences, and, and a couple of things happened uh, that are specifically linked to Christian theology. First, from its very premise that all individuals are invited into a personal relationship with God, and that all individuals are equal in God's sight was a revolutionary uh, a revolutionary idea. I mean, no other religion, no other society had ever countenanced that. But it took a transmutation, and I put Thomas Aquinas at the top of the list for the importance of this, to, to make this into the kind of individualism that had such an effect in the West. It was Aquinas who said that it is pleasing to God for us to explore the mysteries of his universe and to understand them and to create th great things of beauty. And along with that, went a couple of other things that, as I looked around the world, gave the West a huge advantage. One was autonomy, this notion that I can act efficaciously as an individual uh, was developed in the West through Christianity in a way it wasn't anywhere else. And, and the, the second is that there was the sense that I have been put on this earth for a purpose, which is a terrific motivator for creative elites. Uh, was more prevalent in Christianity and distinctively prevalent uh, in ways which no other religion matched. And, and I'm giving real short statements about a very complicated topic. A lot of the origins of the scientific method and the rest of it grew from this directly. Let me ask you about a small vignette you paint in your book about climbing to the top of the Gothic cathedrals and seeing little gargoyles. And the gargoyles are put in spots where no one can see them. And you raise the question, why did the people who did those things put them in a place and, and carve them with a detail that no one could possibly appreciate? Why did they? They, they had a saying for that among the stonemasons, that they were carving for the eye of God. And a great deal of what goes on with creative elites, people who devote themselves mon monomaniacally to creating great works, whether they're in science or the arts, is this kind of passion which is most easily expressed as carving for the eye of God. Would it be fair to say that if it wasn't for Athens and it wasn't for Jerusalem, many of the things that even the atheists care most about, the idea of the individual, the idea of rights, autonomy, free enterprise, these things might not have developed in the West? They not only might not have developed in the West, these were things that never developed anywhere else except in the West individualism is distinctively a Western creation, and I would place that very directly, causally, uh, in the, the, the influence of Christianity. Thank you very much. Mr. Lansberg. So, uh, you, uh, you describe yourself as an agnostic, correct? That's correct. And can a, an agnostic be a good person? Yes, indeed. Okay, so we don't need religion to be moral. We don't need religion to be good. We do not. We do not. Okay. Now, the five centuries of achievement you talked about, culminating in the Renaissance and so forth, a lot of magnificent stuff there, as I said in my opening, the cathedrals and so on. Did any of that have any significant effect on the quality of life for any significant number of people? Does the existence of Shakespeare have any significant effect on the quality of life? Well, yeah. It, it does now that we're rich enough to appreciate it. Did it when, everybody, when essentially everybody on earth was starving? There is no great work of art or music or literature that has not materially, massively affected the lives of people after it was created. 
I, it's, um, I think that's going to be pretty tough to tell the people who are struggling to figure out how they're going to survive till tomorrow. Um, the, uh, when we talked about the achievements of the Greeks, they, they didn't have Christianity, did they? No, and the Greeks did lay the foundation, but they did not have individualism. The, the Greeks, were, in fact, including Aristotle, uh, never, uh, uh, never created the concept of individualism as it developed in the West after Christianity. But they certainly created great works of art, yes? Oh, yes, and, and they've created great works, great works of, of art of... in China and South Asia and a variety of civilizations. And science and mathematics? Well, now, this, there's, an interesting, there's an interesting case because you did have in China enormously clever uh, insights into how things work, they never developed the method which was an accumulation of all of this. And, and the reason why it happened in the West is a complicated story. A lot of it has to do with the individualism in the West, because in, in Asia there is much less willingness to stand up and say, I'm right and you're wrong and argue it out, which is the, the essence of how the scientific method got started. So let me be clear then that you're saying that most religions are actually quite destructive, or at least not constructive. No, I didn't say that. I, I, said, that, 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 I said that human achievement is, is fostered by the kind of individuality, especially in the sciences, which allows people to fight like cats and dogs, and in which people are immensely confident that I personally am right and you are wrong, and we will fight this out to the man. And that in, in Asia is a very alien way of looking at it. But the this. Asians have religion, yes? Yes, they do. And, and yet they don't have these... Uh... That's because Christianity had advantages that Confucianism and Taoism did not in terms of developing the scientific method. So you're, you're really not here to defend religion. You're here to defend a religion, a religion in which you don't believe. I'm, I'm, here, to <laughs> I'm here to respond to questions about its role in creating Western civilization. Uh -huh. and, and if, regardless of what those uh, uh, contributions may have been, do any of those contributions give us a reason to believe in it? That's not the question that we're debating. What's the question I'm, I'm asking I, The you? question we are debating is, has religion been constructive? And I've been asked about its role in fostering Western civilization, and I'm saying that role has been huge and constructive. And, and yet much of that happened before Christianity existed. I mean, the Archimedes lived before Christianity. No, no, the, sir, exactly the opposite. Yes. I am saying that there was a critical turning point in the accumulation of human knowledge, especially the scientific method, that happened as a causal causally linked phenomenon with Christianity being a causal agent there. Mr. Murray, thank you, sir. You may step down. Call your next witness, Mr. D'Souza. I call Mr. Patrick Fagan. Mr. Fagan, will you take an oath on the Holy Bible? Thank God. <laughs> do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Mr. Fagan, are you sure you know what you're getting yourself into here? <laughs> All right. Mr. Fagan, say a word about your uh, occupation and your credentials. Sure. Either. Um, Pat Fagan, I'm a... Uh, Can you put that mic right? right I'm a... Uh, doctorate in sociology, uh, was a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation for about 13 years, senior fellow and director of the Marriage and Religion Research Institute at Family Research Council, clinical psychologist by training as well. And you've been investigating the question, a very simple question, which is, does religion lead to better behavior or does it lead to bad behavior? Uh, well, what have you found? Well, I am going to give you a quick slideshow, so put your seatbelts on. We're going to go very quickly through U.S. federal government data with the largest samples of United States citizens in existence. Looking at just the straight correlation, this is a map of America. This is how Americans act depending on how frequently they worship, no matter their religion, Catholic, Protestant, Jew, Muslim. In education, the grade point average of children at high school uh, on your far left there, you see those who worship weekly, a couple of times a month, a couple of times a year, and never. 
federal government is spending billions to try and get changes like that. Religion delivers it for nothing. Children in high poverty areas, their academic on track performance, these are the poor. High religious attendance gets highest, average attendance, and then lowest. And those at the highest are outperforming middle class kids in the best or the ordinary good middle class school districts. Um, women who have attained a bachelor's degree, you can see the same slant. Getting expelled or suspended, kids who come from families and the kids themselves worship weekly, you can see that they do least, and the kids who get expelled most, twice as much almost. Now let's look at violence and crime. There was a lot of debate about that earlier. Ever getting into a fight, these are teenage kids in high school. Weekly, on the far left, a couple of times a month, a couple of times a year, and never gets higher. Theft among teenagers. Now, as you can see in all these things, people who go to church weekly are not saints. They're not canonizable, but they are better. Uh, repeat shoplifting, even people who go to, kids who go to church weekly, they do repeat shoplifting, but a lot, a lot less. Uh, running away from home by religious attendance. This is very important. Anybody who knows anything about crime, Maybe about Maybe they can run away because they're in church. No? <laughs> it's outside the church they do this. <laughs> Drugs and alcohol abuse, lowest, there you can see that, look at that, massive differences. Getting drunk by religious attendance, you can see here in this one, sometimes a very little religion is worse than none. <laughs> sometimes he drinks too much, you can see the same thing. Marriage and family, very important thing. Rates of adultery, lowest. Twice as high among those who never go to church which has a huge impact on marriage, on family, on kids, and in turn on education, on crime, etc., etc. Personal importance of having children by religious attendance, huge. All around the world, all religions, those who worship God, have much greater inclination to have children than okay, see as Okay, I think we get the point of the charts. Uh, Great. Mr. D'Souza, next question, please. When you look at all this data, and which shows a correlation between religious attendance and behavior, what conclusion do you draw? What conclusion do you draw? <laughs> Very simple. The more people worship God, the better they do. The same also happens, actually, if you go through the same social science data. If you look at those who value religion most, you get much the same outcomes. The more people value religion, by and large, the better they act, the better they score and the least likely they're going to be to cause difficulties. Okay, so in a sense... Last question, make it quick because In we, a sense, am I right to say that this data makes, you could call it the skeptics case for religion? Because you're not relying, you're rely, the skeptics say we want data, we want science, we want facts, you're delivering the facts, and the facts show that by the skeptics' own criterion, religion is good for people and it's good for society, true or false? I couldn't have said it better, thank you. Thank Mr. you very Mr. your witness. <laughs> So, so, Mr. Fagan, you, you have a, a PhD in, tell us again? Social policy, sociology, and social administration, a combination of both. And in the course of getting that PhD, you took courses in, t in statistics? Oh, I did. Were you absent on the day they discussed the difference between causation and correlation? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a single thing in the social sciences that, that can be causally nailed. Are, are you aware of the vast literature in econometrics where uh, consisting of techniques for establishing causation via two-stage least squares, instrumental variables, <laughs> sure, structural modeling. Sure. Actually, and, the and social scientists who have to deal with people like you on the faculty have the hardest time in the universities and as a result they do precisely what you say and even when they do that, their skeptical faculty won't admit that religion has a huge so, impact. Can you take your favorite one or two of these studies and explain to us how they controlled for the correlation versus causation, what, what method they used to do that? I don't think you understand correlation. I said this is correlation. There are no controls oh. in correlation. This is a map of America just as people are oh. and as they are. So in other words, it really is not telling us anything at all about causality. It's telling us a lot about America. It's not telling us anything about causality. It's telling us a lot about American people. It's not telling us anything about causality. I think you said that before. I did. <laughs> and I think, I, I think uh, that's really all I need to ask this witness. Okay, thank you. Uh, you may step down, sir. Now you each may have four, I'm going to say four minutes for an opening, st for a closing statement. 
Um, and uh, we will start with Mr. Landsberg. You know, D Dinesh brought up the Inquisition. He wanted to sort of minimize the evil of it, say they only killed a few hundred people, a couple thousand I think it actually is. But the number of people killed is not a measure of the number of people suppressed, the number of people uh, 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 dominated, the number of people whose lives were, who, who, whose freedom was taken away. In the late years of the Soviet Union, they weren't killing a lot of people, but the threat of killing people was what it takes to take away freedom. Second of all, the Inquisition is the tip of the iceberg. The Inquisition is the tip of the iceberg in terms of centuries of libels, pogroms, massacres, mostly against the Jews, led by Christian clergy, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, 2,000 burned alive in 1348 in Strasbourg, 6,000 burned in one day in Mainz in 1349, 600 killed in 1349 in Brussels, 10,000 murdered in one day in Bavaria in 1350, 350 separate massacres all over Europe over the next three years, to the point where Richard Runcie, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, said that the passion with which people followed Hitler's hatred was born and grew in the soil that was tilled by centuries of Christian anti-Semitism. This was all led by Christian clergy. Second of all, I want to come back to the issue of understanding the difference between right and wrong and how we have never needed religion for that. 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, a great anti-religious revolutionary taught us to love our neighbors as ourselves. You know, there was an old religion. Jesus Christ rebelled against an old religion that prescribed capital punishment for gathering firewood on the Sabbath. If religion were the arbiter of morality, we wouldn't know whether to trust the old one or the new one. The fact that we can tell that one of those religions is better than the other, that's got to be coming from a moral instinct other than religion. It's got to be coming. So I take my stand with Jesus Christ. And I say that religion is not the fountain of morality. Thank you, Mr. Landsberg. Mr. D'Souza. Mr. Landsberg spends virtually all his closing statement rebutting an argument that was never made, namely that you require God to be good. I didn't say it. I've never written it. I don't believe it. So let's consider that to be flailing at the air. Now, he, men he mentions the Inquisition, but I brought it up not to defend it. It was bad, it was wrong, and religion has done wrong, and a lot of bad things have been done in the name of religion. But we should get a little bit of perspective. If you were to add up the crimes of religion, the Crusades, the Inquisition, the Salem witch trials, and so on, you have to compare it to something, because maybe there's something in human nature that makes us do terrible things. You got to see whether religion is making things worse or making things better. So let's look at societies that have liberated themselves from religion, not Europe. Europe is still drenched in religion. It's drenched in the legacy of religion, even if it's secular in its habits now. You have to go to societies that have gone to some length to extirpate religion, to create, if you will, the religion-free society. Now, we've had those societies in the 20th century, and I'm not just thinking, by the way, of Stalin in Russia or Mao in China. They would make my case too easy. You can even go to, you can call them the Little League atheists. Consider a guy like Pol Pot. He doesn't even normally make the atheist list. He's not on the A team. And yet, in Indochina, following the Vietnam War, Pol Pot and his Khmer Rouge, in the space of about three years, managed to wipe out two million people. Two million. Even bin Laden in his wildest dreams doesn't even come close. So the point I'm trying to make is that atheism, not religion, is really responsible for the mass murders of history. If you look at religion, and specifically the Christian religion, which we know best because it shaped our civilization, I think we've tried to show that many of the greatest achievements of our civilization are rooted in Christianity and would not have taken place if it wasn't for Christianity. Much of our science grew out of Christian soil. Not Christianity alone. Athens, you might say, modified by Jerusalem. But not Athens alone. 
Athenian society was very different. We see it now through the prism of Jerusalem. And then we come to the facts on the ground. If you're raising a kid, if you're trying to face death, if you want the experience of the sublime, ask yourself, are you going to be better off with belief or without belief? Death, we got to face it anyway. Doesn't religion offer us a way to face it better? Doesn't religion offer us that hope that enables us to pass through this experience, in a sense, with consolation and with optimism? Let's look at raising our children in a moral way. Isn't it easier to raise them in a church than not? True, there might be other forms of Can you raising... please wrap it up, Mr. D'Souza? I will. <laughs> religion, historically, is the transmission belt for, for raising our children moral morally. I'm not saying you need God to be good, but if you are in a church and you follow the teachings of the church, you're going to see many of the beneficial social outcomes for your family, for yourself, and for us as a society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. D'Souza. <laughs> Who is the foreman of the jury? Will you please stand, sir? Oh. <laughs> Which one is it? You're the... <laughs> Sir, would you please do a poll through raising of the hand um, of, your, of your jury to see whether they believe that he is guilty, Mr. Dinesh D'Souza is guilty or not guilty? Is that one? I think they're confused about what they're voting on. Okay. Let me be very clear about this. Religion is on trial. Dinesh D'Souza represents religion. He is on trial for supporting these religious ideas. You've heard the testimony. Do you believe that religion and Dinesh D'Souza are guilty as charged? How many of you believe that Dinesh D'Souza and religion are guilty? Please raise your hands. How many of you say not guilty? I believe it's 10 to 2. That means oh, that... Uh, Your Honor. <laughs> but wait a minute. Hold on. I want a real jury of your peers. <laughs> I want to ask the audience here what you believe, and I believe you will be the ultimate jury on this. How many of you believe that Dinesh D'Souza and religion are guilty as charged? Raise your hand. Are you keeping track of this? I am. Okay. I am, Your Honor. How many of you believe that Dinesh D'Souza is innocent of the charges? Not guilty wins by Not about guilty. 60 percent. Mr. D'Souza? Mr. D'Souza, you are a free man. You are free to go, sir. <laughs> Thank you for everyone participating in this terrific trial. Mr. Landsberg, fabulous job. Members of the jury, thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Bailiff. Your Honor, we want to thank you all for participating in the trial tonight. We have only one announcement left. Both Stephen Landsberg and Denise D'Souza will have an autograph session for their respective books directly in the back. Dinesh D'Souza is a former policy analyst in the Reagan White House. Stephen Landsberg is an economics professor at the University of Rochester. For more information, visit freedomfest.com.